Good morning and welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us again. I'm very pleased to be able to present Dr. Louis Vessels this morning and to share in his experience in Antarctica. Louis is a neurosurgeon. He had his schooling at Pretoria and Stellenbosch. He matriculated from the Paul Ruiz Gymnasium in 1959 and received his military training at Voortrek Hoogte in 1960. He obtained his doctor's degree at the University of Pretoria in 1966 and received his neurosurgery training in Pretoria, Cape Town and Bloemfontein between 1968 and 1975. His studies were interrupted to join the Antarctic expedition from December 1970 to March 1972. He obtained his neurosurgery degree at Freeside University in 1975. He practiced as a neurosurgeon in Bloemfontein, Johannesburg, and Somerset West from 1975 until 2016, with various academic appointments, scientific publications, and presentations of local and international congresses during that time. Louis, thank you very much for sharing your experience with us and for the preparation. We're really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Gert. Good morning, everybody. I was fortunate to join the South African National Antarctic Expedition in December 1970. We left Cape Town just after New Year in 71 and returned to Cape Town in March 1972. Now, just a bit of background. The Antarctic Treaty was signed on the 1st of December 1959. There were 12 countries who were signatory to this treaty, of which the Union of South Africa was one. The crux of the treaty was that the Antarctic continent would not be used for any military activity. There would be freedom of scientific investigation, free exchange of scientific plans and data. But the main thing, there would be no nuclear activity various other agreements, and this treaty was signed in Washington on the 1st of December 1959. Now, the first South African Antarctic expedition was in 1960, under the leadership of Hannes Legrancy, and there's been a presence on the Antarctic continent ever since. On a yearly basis, the teams are changed. Just a bit of perspective, there's the Antarctic continent, there's South Africa, Cape Town. The continent is three times as big as the Republic of South Africa and a third the size of the African continent. There's Antarctica. There's the Sinai base. There are now various bases around the continent. When we were down there, the, our closest neighbors were the Russians over there and the Brits at Halle Bay over there. There's the South Pole. Now the Antarctic continent is mostly covered in ice. There's a, a section through the topography. The interesting thing here is the ice shelf, which stretches about, in most places, about 100 kilometers beyond the edge of the continent. The average height of Antarctica is approximately 2,000 meters with the highest points reaching up to 4,000 meters. This ice shelf, I will speak about the hinge area later on where the ice shelf meets the continent, because that's where we get our crevasses and they cause a lot of heartaches and stress. Now, the purpose of our expedition was primarily to construct a new base which was the Sinai II base. The first one was built in 1961. Our first two teams stayed in the old Norwegian base. It's a very important weather station. And together with Goff Island, there's Goff Island and there's Marion Island. Those are our three most important offshore weather stations. There's a scientific program going on annually, sponsored by various universities, like Rhodes University, Potchefstroom, Durban University, and we had 
some geologists from various state departments, of whom Andy Patterson was one. The Sinai 12 team actually consisted of two teams. At the main base, there was the leader, the radio operator, radio technician, two mechanics, three weathermen, four physicists from the universities, and then the medical officer, the Borga team under leadership of Andy Patterson, left for Borga, but never got there. They got as far as Grunehokna, and then they were tied down by the weather. They had two geologists, a mechanic, a physicist doing radio echo sounding, and a male nurse. In 1960, the first Antarctic team, as I said, under Hannes Lagranzi, went down to the old Norway base, the Norway station, and the Sinai 2 team was there as well. Incidentally, the teams that went down are numbered numerically in Arabic figures, and the bases are numbered in Roman figures. So the Sinai 1 base was built by the Sinai 3 team, and that was in 1962. And that's also when the RSA was commissioned. In 69, the Borga field base was built about 350 kilometers south of Sinai. And Andy Patterson's team, unfortunately, never reached the Borga base, but bogged down at Grunahogna. Now, we were the Sinai 12 team, and we built the Sinai 2 base, very close to the Sinai 1 base, which at that stage was about 50 meters under the ice. Sinai 3 was built also on the ice shelf in 1979, when the Sinai 2 base was also about 40 or 50 meters under the ice. Now, this is just a, a photograph I get, got from the internet of the Sinai 4 base, which, which was built on the continent, on a rock face, with the hope that it wouldn't disappear under the ice as the others had. This is the RSA, which was the Antarctic support ship. It was the first South African Antarctic supply vessel, built in Osaka in Japan, launched in September 1961. It took the third South African Antarctic team down to the Antarctic continent in January of 62. The first and second Sanite teams were transported by Norwegian vessels, Polar Bjorn and Polar Havre. The RSA was replaced by the SA Gullis in 1978 and she joined the South African Navy for oceanic survey, surveillance along the Angola coast and then she was anchored in Cape Town Harbour as a static training ship. She was eventually dismantled but when they found asbestos in the panels she was taken out to sea and sunk. This is the RSA departing Cape Town, December 1970. As you can see, we even had some of the KWV products aboard. We were each rationed to half a bottle of wine and four beers per week. And it was the doctor's privilege to keep the key of the store. This is now the RSA on its en route. Um, this was when I could still bear on the deck and take photos and do this movie. For most of the time I was uh, in my cabin, so sick that I couldn't move, as most of the uh, rest of the team. The Roaring Forties, we haven't even seen. I couldn't photograph those. And the Furious Fifties, even less. Finally, we arrived in calm waters. This photograph was taken just about midnight on the 28th of January, 1971. There's a period where the sun shines forever and a period in winter when we never see the sun for two and a half months. Captain. 
one of the icebergs. First animals we came across. We had two little Adelie penguins and a leopard seal. Now we're approaching the ice shelf. This little bay was called the Otterbukta. There was a, a Canadian aircraft which crashed not very far from here, a, a twin otter, and hence the name of this bay. Bukta is a Norwegian term for bay. Some of the first animals we met. These emperor penguins have a number of colonies scattered all over the Antarctic continent, and they are the only permanent inhabitants of Antarctica, except humans, of course. And these Adelie penguins migrate north during the Antarctic winter. This is our first encounter of a snowstorm. There's the ice shelf to which we were tied or moored. And then the unloading started and transport of fuel and equipment and building material to the new building site. There were two types of tractors, this, this Caterpillar D4 and the other was a Muskeg. I'll show you a photo a lot later on. Muskeg is a Canadian vehicle with a petrol engine. This is diesel. The new base consisted of seven buildings that looked like this. There's the power shack. These are the living quarters and the others are still to come. And they were then joined by a long passage running parallel to the buildings and joined to the buildings at both ends because of fire risks. Leveling the terrain for the uh, snow passage. And this is the muskeg I was talking about with the petrol engine. This is eventually what the snow passage looked like. It's closed up on the sides of the Hessian, but the first snowstorm it looked like this. Later on, it's used for storage. Those are diesel drums. And these are oral provisions. These are drums, obviously on one side and the food on the other side. That passage was more than 100 meters long. This is goodbye to the RSA. Um, probably the loneliest moment of my life. You wonder, what have I done? Anyway, this is the base after a month or two, as you see the, the buildings in a row. There's a hatch going down into the snow passage. And some of the antennas have gone up. The radio operator, the power shack. We had three air-cooled Deutz engines pulling the generators. And the interesting thing here is the exhaust gases from the motors were led through a double-walled tank, which was fed from the top through a shaft. And it was the job of the skivvy who was on duty that particular day to fill up that tank with snow, which was then melted by the heat of the diesel engines and then automatically pumped into that storage tank. From that storage tank, there was a pipe through to the living quarters and into the sleeping quarters. And when a tap is opened, a motor would go on and pump water into the specific area that it was wanted. There's the radio operator. Two years later, he was a, a leader of another expedition. Dining room. There on the wall is a an inometer showing the outside wind speed in knots. And it wasn't uncommon to see a wind speed of 80 to 90 uh, knots, which was almost double that in kilometers an hour. Each of the team would cook for three days at a time. It was my job to supply them with whatever they needed for their menus. And towards the end of our period down there, I could sell my cooking duties for a 
a packet of cigarettes because I didn't smoke. I had been issued with about two paraffin tanks full of Lucky Strike cigarettes. So for one packet, I sold a day of cooking duties. We had a nice library, even a billiard table. Mechanic. This is one of the Met fellows following his balloon, which was launched every night. My hospital was equipped with an X-ray tube, sterilizer. This is part of a Boyle's machine, which is the prototype of the modern anesthetic machine. Fortunately, I never had to use it. This is the base, almost covered with all the antennas. That tall one was for the ionosonde. Rhodes University was studying the ionosphere. This is an interesting technical photograph of, of the uh, aurora. Now to photograph the aurora, the temperature is probably in the region of minus 40 to minus 50 degrees. You have to open the shutter and leave it there for about 15 minutes and go back, by which time the mechanism had frozen up. So you close the lens with the lens cover and wait until it defrosts in the base before it closes. These are some more photographs of the Aurora. This is midwinter. Midwinter is the 21st of June. Festivities are really great on that day because now we know soon we'll see the sun again. Cook makes a, a special meal and we even had champagne. This is midday on midwinter's day. And this is how light it became. The last time we saw the sun was on the 17th of May. And we saw it again for the first time on uh, the 31st of July. So that's two and a half months of no sun. There's some of the crystals we saw in the base. And these are the crystals we saw outside the base. It's our leader, Gustav Nell. Now, one of our modes of transport was these huskies. Traditionally from the first teams, they used huskies for transport. They were later replaced by mechanical means. Each of these huskies had his own pole. If you let them loose, they eat each other. So for their own safety, they were kept tied to the poles. It was difficult to accept initially, but as time went by, we saw that they actually liked it. We took one of the old dogs into the base and he caused a havoc. It wasn't a good idea. These are two of the pups that were born the year before we got there. They were allowed to roam free. They are at the top of the shaft here, asking to be let in. We had one litter of pups from the bitch. This is them growing up. This little guy was the runt of the litter and came home with me. Travel in the Antarctic by Husky. This was late, I say early summer. At night, the Huskies were tied to a long chain, again, so they wouldn't eat each other. They're very happy dogs. This is the team in Spain. There are two ways of, of doing this. You can have the fan arrangement where each dog has its own chain without the long central disselboom. Because of the crevasses, one of us used to run in front of the team and tied to the chain of the lead dog. If you went into a crevasse, the one on the back on the brake of the, of the sledge would dig in until you had time to climb out again. This is a bit of a storm during a trip. Every 20 kilometers, there was this beacon. It's a diesel drum on top of a pole, which helped for navigation. 
closer to the mountains, it was easier. We tried to travel on skis in the crevasse region, which lessened the chances of falling in. Because the, the crevasses are covered. They're covered in snow. And some of that snow is soft. It was not uncommon a vehicle or a person to fall into one of those, as you'll see later. This, this expedition, in fact, took us, due to storms, almost three weeks to get to our destination, which was at Andy Patterson's camp, Grinner Hockner. The purpose of this expedition was to take two blocks and tackle to help to pull a caterpillar out of a crevasse. This is the Gruner Hockner base, a photograph taken by Trevor Schaefer, who was there for the year. This is Andy's pet dog, Viking. This dog had broken a leg and the year before us, the doctor had plated the leg. Obviously, he couldn't be used for sledging anymore. And he went with Andy and his team to their base here in the mountains at Grinogna. This is our arrival at the Grinogna base. I was presented with a, a lovely cup of coffee made with condensed milk. Can you imagine after a three week trip with these dogs to meet somebody who offered you a cup of hot coffee filled with condensed milk? Now there's a caterpillar that had come to grief. This just shows what lies under the ice that you can't see. And this is in the hinge area where that ice shelf hinges to the continent. You also see them along the edges of the glaciers. Those are the blocks and tackles and a combined effort of the two teams to pull this caterpillar out of that crevasse successfully. There wasn't much time for photography. By the way, that dog that Andy Patterson took with him also landed up in one of these crevasses. And Andy got a, a medal from the Red Cross Society for going down on the winch rope of the muskeg to save that dog. Congratulations, Andy. This is now on our way back. This is the caterpillar that had been pulled out of the crevasse. And this is the team that went to rescue them. This guy's name was Chuck. I called him Al Capone. As you can see, his ear is full of blood. He loved fighting. Back at home base, we had a few chores. One of them was to uncover the fuel depot, which was by that time under the surface of the snow. It felt like miles and miles and miles of drums. Finally, time came to say goodbye to everybody. We waited all night for the ship to arrive. There's the old RSA, moving to the back ice. This is the team. That's Patterson. That's the night we arrived in Cape Town. We had to lie there until the following morning. And that's all I've got. Thanks for sharing with me. Excellent, Louis. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are many questions. I'm going to ask you one quickly. You told me that you actually spent a lot of your time managing the dogs. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Well, that was part of my job description was to take care of these dogs. There were 25 of them eventually. They are used for sledging between the ages of two and four years. At two years, we could start putting them in a harness. We put a young dog with an older dog. 
and he'd learn his manners pretty quickly. I think the original dogs came from the Norwegians. Some of them came from a Belgian team who had been in the region some years before. They had a mixture of Greenland Huskies and the Siberian Malamute. And with our intermarriage of certain males and females at the base, we got a hybrid dog, but they worked pretty hard. And we could load a sledge with about 100 pounds, that's 50 kilograms per dog. So with 11 dogs, transport quite a weight. We started bringing them back. It was actually the last year that they were actively used to transport people and goods. We brought back about six of them and the rest came back the following year. We were told to euthanize some of them, but that was difficult to do. We managed to euthanize one of them who was old and injured. And that was such an emotional episode. Mm -hmm. We rather brought them back. I had a, that little runt of the litter that I brought back, grew up into a lovely dog, but it nearly caused the end of my marriage. I got married two months after getting back from Antarctic continent. And this dog very, very nearly came between us. So we gave him to a sheep farmer in the Free State. We had to sew up some of the wounds when they broke loose and got involved in fights. But on the whole, they kept me busy. They kept me far more busy than my human patients. The humans I treated were for minor injuries. One guy broke his leg, that was Rick, the radio operator. I had to put his leg in a cast. Frostbite was common. We didn't lose any fingers or toes, fortunately. And otherwise the team was rather healthy. I had a, a research program which it was run by the Department of Labor Research in Johannesburg, where I had to dock adaptation tests on every person once a month with an apparatus which was supplied. And at the same time, he had to do a psychometric questionnaire. I had to draw blood, um, put it in a centrifuge, and then freeze the serum for later analysis had to collect urine specimens and freeze them for later analysis. Now all this material somehow got lost in transit with our journey back. So that scientific data was lost and no publication ever came from that. Can I ask a question on that, that topic? Did you have to deal with any psychological trauma from being isolated and continuously in the company of the same group of people. We all managed to slip through this psychological testing that we had to undergo beforehand, except one person. And unfortunately, Andy was stuck with him. Maybe Andy could tell us about psychological abnormalities because he had to deal with them. Firstly, I want to say, Louis, that was an excellent presentation. It took me back 50 years instantly to the Antarctic. And I saw that side of the Antarctic that I never experienced because we went into the mountains. So it's a first for me. Everything that we've been seeing today is actually a first for me. Um, and I, I really do appreciate seeing it. Can I just say regarding the dogs, the dogs, as Louis showed you, all chained to their different posts. And the doctor was every year was in charge of the dogs. And I saw this one dog and they told me it had broken its leg. And I got that story. And I said to the doctor of the previous expedition, can I take a dog into the field? He said, under no circumstances do you take dogs to the field. So when he went back on the boat, I asked Louis the same question. Louis said, yeah, if you want to take a dog, take a dog. And I must thank you, Louis. That was one of the most wonderful things in my life to experience having a dog in the Antarctic with us. In terms of psychology, I think that dog was a focal point for the five of us in the mountains. Otherwise, it was wonderful. So, but I can't really say anything about the psychological side of people. Other than that, we had a wonderful time. I think the whole team had a wonderful time. Can I ask you about the feeding of the dogs? 
They looked Sorry? in pretty good condition from those excellent photos you showed us, Louis. Were there special rations to give the dogs the condition and the energy they needed for um, pulling the, the sleds and weight along? Yeah, we had three staple foods. When we arrived in the Antarctic and we were all busy building the new base, the captain of the RSA with an old Army 303 culled some of the leopard seals, 10 of them. And they were then brought not very far from the, from the new base. And the mechanic helped me there to saw them up into blocks with his chainsaw. I refused to use the damn thing. The other was a, a supply of whale meat that came with us. And when the chainsaw broke, they ate mainly whale meat. When we were out in the field, we had 60 pound tins filled with one pound blocks of pemmican made by Bob Martins. And they loved this. Now at the base, we'd feed them every second day. A block of about six kilograms of whale meat or seal meat. And the days in between, they would get the slops from the kitchen. The pemmican blocks we saved for, for the field trips uh, because they, they were concentrated and you didn't need the same weight. I'm reluctant to say so, but these huskies are terrible animals. They would recycle their food. But that's mm. another story. Yes, that's what we fed them. Sometimes it was very difficult to get to them. In those <coughs> Antarctic storms, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. We had a little sledge, about a meter long and half a meter wide. And I would defrost the meat in the power shack. And load this little shed with the blocks of meat. I'd tie myself to a rope and head in the general direction where I knew the dogs were. And then find my, my way back to the base along the same rope. On one of these occasions, I came across one of the scientists who had been to his little outside station and he'd lost his way coming back. I think if I hadn't fed the dogs that day, this guy mm. would still be missing. Thank you for a very interesting talk, Louis. You indicated that the emperors were the only permanent residents in the, or on the Antarctic. What happened to the Adelis? Do they go up to South Georgia, the Falklands, or to South America? They move north. Where they go, I'm not sure, but they move north. Okay, thank you. I have another dog question before we leave the dogs. Um, I, I was surprised when you said that if you left them um, loose, that they would actually kill each other. I've Maybe I'm naive, but I've thought of a pack of dogs as like a family of dogs that get to, you know, get on together. Uh, and usually animals will turn on each other if there's some kind of stress. So could you talk a little about that? Well, it was interesting. I was very tempted to let them loose. I spoke to the dog master for radio at Halley Bay, which was the British base. Their dogs were let loose and they had no problem. What they did find was that the males fought because they liked fighting, but the mm -hmm. females would fight to kill. We had two females and the rest were obviously male. My impression was that the males also liked to find a sort of a pecking order. And when sledging, we'd put biggest fighters in first and put them together. They'd mm -hmm. sort themselves out and mm -hmm. then lie and wait for the next. And we'd bring two more and they would sort themselves out. And eventually when everybody was sorted, we'd bring the leader out and hook him to the front, pull the stakes and off we go. And they'd run for the first kilometer. There were no ways that you could keep up with them at, at that speed. So two of us would be on the sledge until they got settled down. Then 
I would go out to the front and run with the lead dog. But when they were in the field, they didn't really fight. They made growling noises, but we couldn't risk having a dog hurt to such an extent that he couldn't work because you would be miles and miles from the base. So that was the reason. The, why we tied them up at the base was for the same reason. Some of them, when they did break loose, they really got injured quite badly. And it was a problem sewing up with damaged dogs. They recovered remarkably well, but we tied them up to, to protect them from themselves. I didn't want to take the chance of letting them lose. So that's not an indication of stress of some kind, perhaps? I think there was another reason for stress, but they, they loved working. They were jolly dogs, happy dogs. As vicious as they are, the way that you explained, they never turned on people, did they? No. I piled into them on numerous occasions when they were really having a brawl, and I never even had one accidental bite. What do the dogs drink? Do they just lick the ice around them? That's not so easy. No, they chew the ice. How can a dog put a, a wet, warm tongue onto ice, which has got an ambient temperature of minus 20 or something, without its tongue sticking on the... You know, how does that work? Have they, have they, they got special adaptations? I can't understand it. There's always a loose, uh, a layer of loose snow because there's forever a storm. Very seldom that you have more than a couple of days without mm -hmm. a storm. And that hard ice is forever covered in a mm -hmm. layer of soft snow of varying depth. And then your food, you had eggs. How long did the eggs last? Did they get frozen? Presumably you had lots of frozen veg veggies, frozen meat. Can you tell us a bit about the food? Lots and lots of eggs. Frozen chickens as well. <laughs> <laughs> and other frozen meats we also had. But most of it was tin food and dried food. We even made beer from dried potatoes. We got the recipe fr from the Russians. We used to play chess against the Russians by Morse code. There was no direct radio communication. So we'd send the moves through by Morse code. But they had a German doctor with them. And this doctor gave us the recipe how to make vodka from the dried potatoes. Sounds more like vodka than beer. We never tried to classify it. It didn't make us sick. <laughs> Louis, first of all, very happy. Very thank you. It's very inspiring. You were going to have your 50th get-together now, and I think COVID disrupted that, and there was a group photograph. How many of you have survived these past 50 years from that group photograph, and did the others actually get together this year? Unfortunately, I don't know how many have survived. I know of two that have died. Nine of us would have gone to this reunion in May, I got as far as Wimberg when the minister advised that no public meeting should be held. And I got scared and turned around. But eventually there were four of the 18 at the reunion. The five in the Borgo team are still alive, thankfully. But again, I didn't know of anybody else who's died. Um, but I, I want to give one small story about Louis himself if uh, you don't mind, Louis. We'd been like 12 months in the field and the geologist, other geologist, Jan Bredel and myself, uh, decided to walk the last 20 kilometers back to the camp. So we were just walking across the ice with the Viking. Uh, and then this figure comes running out from the base. And it's Louis. He says, stop, stop. Don't do anything. Don't talk to anybody. There's a virus in the base and I want you in my rooms immediately. You're not allowed to speak to anybody. So we had to go down the hatch and we thought, what the hang's happened here? And we sit down and Lou opens a bottle of Rudeberg red wine for us. He said, this will help you. So, <laughs> <laughs> you remember that, Louis? I can't remember what it tasted. 
better than potato beer, I'm sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Andy, can you tell us a little bit more about what your mission was? We were to uh, map the geology and do the glaciology inland. And that was part of an ongoing program. And we didn't, as Louis said, we never met, met our, our destination target. We stopped halfway, but we managed to cover a very wide area of 500 square kilometers uh, for our summer logging you know, or mapping season. Anybody else, you're welcome to ask questions. I'd like to say something, but mine isn't a question. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you very, very much for sharing it with us. I've learned so much. Thank you. These slides have been in cold storage for so long. It was the film we used was uh, ectochrome. We had a dark room in the base, and I attempted to, to develop some of these photographs. And <laughs> I put the wrong liquids together, and they came out with very peculiar colors. So, uh, unfortunately, I lost a whole series of them. So I left the rest until I got back and had them developed here. Uh, the movie that I took was Super 8. That had to be digitalized, first of all. And then the format of the file had to be changed to allow me to use an editing program to try and splice something together. The same thing with the slides. They were digitalized, also the wrong formats, and that had to be changed. So, uh, I could put them on the computer. Well, unless there are any last questions, I'm going to end the session now. Well, it remains for me to thank Louis for a really fascinating presentation. And what makes it so interesting is that it is a personal account of all you experienced. Thank you for all the preparation, particularly having to digitize all your information and transferring it to the various formats. Thank you too for everybody that participated this morning. Goodbye.